good afternoon and thank you for coming uh, for the launch of the cyber security model laws in Africa. As you know, we have uh, we had a meeting, uh, we validated this report, this guideline during uh, the African Internet Governance Forum held this year in uh, Malawi. Cybersecurity is a very important topic in the continent and we can't uh, realize uh, this uh, digital transition without securing the cyberspace. We have uh, at the continental level several uh, frameworks such as this Convention of Cybersecurity adopted by only 14 countries now. We already adopted also this data governance framework this year. We are working to develop uh, di the, digital single, uh, the single digital market with AUC as well as in African strategy on African on artificial intelligence. All this uh, framework for implementing them, we need to sec secure the cyberspace. And why uh, today we are going to launch this uh, guideline to try to help all African country on the missing link in the Con Malabo Convention. To, before we go to the presentation, of this uh, model law guideline. I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Jean-Paul Adam, the Director of Technology, Climate Change, and Natural Resource Management at the UNECA, to say a few words. Jean-Paul, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Maktar, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you very much for making the effort to join us uh, for this uh, for this event and for the presentation on the proposals for model law on cybersecurity. Uh, as Mark already mentioned, it's a missing link um, because in the African Union Digital Transformation Strategy, one of the pillars is to be able to have appropriate and secure uh, methods to be able to ensure that African populations, governments, businesses all have secure access to the internet and can use it as the development tool that we want it to be. We want to make sure that we can really implement the digital transformation. And in the same way that you will not achieve, uh, you will not achieve the uh, appropriate levels of trade, for example, if your roads and highways are not up to standard and are not safe, in the same way we will not achieve the type of digital transformation that we want if our digital highway is not safe and secure. It's about more than just policing. It's about having a safe space. It's about having a space whereby anyone can access this space in safety and security without harassment uh, and without uh, challenges uh, to their own well-being. The goal of this model law is to really allow countries to implement in a very practical sense the type of enabling framework that allows cybersecurity to be implemented in an African context. We are all aware of the Malabo Convention. We are very close to be up to hopefully getting a full um, for it coming into force with one more signatory. But what we have realized in the engagement with various countries is that the Malabo Convention being overarching, we need to look at it in the context of each individual country. And the hope is that this individual law makes it easier for countries to then adapt to their own situation and thereby look at those aspects of the Malabo Convention that are most relevant to them and facilitate the process by which this can be uh, implemented in their own national context. We, of course, are also uh, developing a regional center uh, on cybersecurity in Lome, uh, and this is another one of the pillars that will help us to deliver on the appropriate format for cybersecurity in countries and provide the appropriate capacity building. 
The center will assist in the continuation of implementation of these kinds of model laws and will also provide a focal point for researchers across the continent looking at cybersecurity, as well as a point of engagement from partners uh, such as civil society and also as such as the private sector. And in conclusion, we are on the cusp of the digital age in Africa. We may feel like we are far behind because yes, we have a lot of catching up to do compared to other regions, but there is also a lot happening. Over $2 billion invested in 2021 in tech start startups in Africa. We are seeing increased investment in uh, digital technologies and infrastructure. 11 out of the 69 projects that have been prioritized under the continental PIDA framework for priority infrastructure, 11 are in ICT-related fields. This is, these are the building blocks that will allow African countries to change their modality of economic growth, moving away from simple extraction and export of resources to true value addition and looking at sustainable value chains that multiply wealth and not extract it. And I think that's where we have to recognize where safety is critical, security is, is critical, and without the right regulatory framework through a cybersecurity law, we will not actually be able to deliver. So this is how important this model law is and just before concluding, I would like to therefore thank all those that have helped us, in particular the consultants, uh, but also the partnerships that we have, uh, notably within the uh, IGF context, the WISIS context, our partnerships with the African Union, and of course, I'd like to thank in particular the ECA team led by MACTA. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing more details on the, the model law. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Thank you very much for that. Let me give now the floor to uh, Nena. She's connected from UK to make a presentation on this uh, guideline. After that, we are going to open the discussion because before we officially launch this uh, model guideline law. Nena, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mokhtar. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I want to say thank you to UNECA for this um, change-making effort and initiative to develop a guideline for an appropriate or model cybersecurity cyber law in Africa, which is much needed. Listening to Jean-Paul talk about it, you would find that on every note, he's absolutely right um, regarding the benefit and the need for such a guideline at a time like this, when Africa is pursuing digital transformation in the entire region. Um, this initiative started um, last year in 2021, and under the guideline and direction of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, Africa now has an appropriate guideline to assist member states in developing appropriate cybersecurity laws and legislation. It has been agreed that the guideline shall be known as the ECA guideline for a model law on computer-enabled and computer-related crimes in the African Union member states. It can also be referred to as the ECA guideline for a model cybersecurity law. In general, this guideline will provide guidance to African member states for designing cybersecurity legislation. It also explains the key features and the benefits of a standard cybersecurity law. Um, before I go forward, I just wanted to you know, draw our minds to the cybersecurity legal framework landscape in Africa to understand the necessity of such a guideline. Firstly, Jean-Paul has talked about the Malabo Convention, the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Um, since 2014, Africa has been working, the AUC has been working to ensure it receives adequate ratification for it to come into force per Article 36 of the Convention. Until date, that convention is still not in force, which means that Africa lacks a regional cybersecurity framework as it is. There is no uniform law across the region to ensure that there is a legislation covering cybersecurity. We are at 14 ratifications as it is, and hopefully can move forward for it to enter into force. Again, research has also shown that out of 54 assessed countries, this was from Africa portal, just 
over half of African countries have a cybersecurity legislation or have passed some form of legislation to promote cybersecurity, which means we're still far behind. Again, you find that even where cybersecurity legislation exists, sometimes the legislation are inappropriate or ineffective. Sometimes you see a copy and pasting of cybersecurity legislation taken from elsewhere. Again, there is no regional cybersecurity strategy. The AUC is still working towards having a regional cybersecurity strategy. The ITU undertake, undertook an assessment this year, and only about a third of Africa's 54 countries have completed a national cybersecurity strategy. And this is less than half the global average. Again, if you look at those cybersecurity strategy, research has also shown that only about three three of the strategy meet the expected demands in terms of what an appropriate cybersecurity strategy is. And so again, I would say that I laud the efforts of UNECA in taking this initiative for the region. So what is the rationale for this cybersecurity guideline? First of all, um, we have to think about the fact that the introduction and implementation of cybersecurity laws is an essential component of a regional response in how we seek to ensure cybersecurity in Africa. If you look at the ITU Global Cybersecurity Index, it still shows that many African countries are at a very weak cybersecurity maturity level. Again, you cannot curb cybersecurity without the appropriate legal framework. Again, we're at a time when we're looking at the digital transformation strategy. We are two years into the digital transformation strategy. We have just eight years left. And we know that effective and efficient digital transformation in Africa can only be achieved with cybersecurity. Again, as I said earlier, many African countries do not have legislation to support cybersecurity. So showing you the necessity to develop these guidelines. Again, you have rampant inappropriate legislation across the region. For example, in 2020, um, permit me to say, um, Nigerian cybersecurity legislation was sort of, there was a move by the ECOWAS court to ask Nigeria to repeal or amend the cybersecurity legislation. In other regions, there are concerns that the cybersecurity legislation do not meet appropriate human rights standard. So sometimes you have inappropriate legislation across the region to support cybersecurity. So a set of guiding principles for African government is very important so that we can establish standards to ensure cybersecurity at global best practices. Now, what was the approach to developing the guideline? We sought to reach a minimum set of baseline considering different factors. First, um, UNECA looked at the national legislation across Africa, the existing legislation in parts of Africa. Again, the Malabo Convention, then the Convention on Cybercrime, which is the Budapest Convention of 2001. Um, we also looked at the United Nations norms of responsible state behavior, and this basically formed parts of the human rights component of the guideline, which keeps ensuring and advocating that states must look at human rights as they police and promote cybersecurity. Finally, we know that there are ongoing efforts to develop a global cybercrime convention. And so as part of the efforts to develop this guideline, attention was given to the processes elaborating, um, the process elaborating a United Nations global convention on countering the use of ICTs for criminal purposes. So for example, on the guideline, you will see topics like ransomware, these are more recent discussions going on at the UN level in terms of what should be in an appropriate cybersecurity or cybercrime legislation. Another important fact to mention, which Mata has talked about, so I would not take us back to this, is the fact that this is not just issued without consideration to appropriate consultation. Um, during the AIGF in Malawi in July, there was an expert forum which was conducted, um, constituted to deliberate on the draft guideline. And so having taken input from experts across the region of different discipline and field related to cybersecurity, that feedback was then consolidated into this final version. You would see a difference from the first draft in the sense that there are now more provisions and the definition of terms is now more expanded to undertake different definitions in relation to the guideline. So what is the object of the guideline? And this is a very important aspect um, in terms of understanding the purpose of the guideline. The guideline is not a law. The guideline is not binding on any African state. The guideline is not a legislation.
It is just a set of guiding principles for Africa member states. So UNECA, for example, is not the AUC and cannot constitute states to say you must have a binding treaty in that sense on the representation or on behalf of African states. So it's a guiding principle which African states can follow as they establish or set out to establish standards for ensuring cyber security or cyber crime laws. So the guideline will not limit, it does not limit, and it cannot limit the operation of any national or regional law which is already in existence or may come into existence in the future that expressly or impliedly regulates cyber security or prohibits any activity that is regarded as cyber crime in their own jurisdiction. The guideline as well, if you look at the wordings of the guideline, it does not attempt to provide specific legislative language for stipulating the provisions of cybersecurity or cybercrime laws or how the implementation of that laws would go. So sometimes you see the wording saying may or should. So it leaves the precise language to the discretion of African states in respect of the sovereignty of African states and recognizing that African states may vary in terms of legal systems. We have Francophone countries and we have Anglophone countries in Africa. So the precise language is left to the discretion of African states. Now, what is the purpose of the guideline? Again, just briefly, it is designed to assist member states in drafting, reforming, and modernizing their cybersecurity laws. So where there are laws already, there are so many developments which African states must begin to think about to modernize their laws, to take into account the need for promoting cybersecurity in the region and to change outdated laws. It's also for policymakers, for legislators who wish to understand the valuable component of a model cybersecurity law. Um, I was in Costa Rica for a Council of Europe event just last month, and one representative of one of the African states was saying they needed a law and that they couldn't find anything and they had to go to the um, Commonwealth model law at that time just to do something in one week so that sort of gives you a vivid evidence or representation of the need for a model guideline the guideline also attempts to breach best practices principle looking at substantive offenses powers and mutual legal assistance as you should have in an appropriate standardized um legislation it also provides guidelines for provisions so apart from the general and elaborate substantive offenses powers you will find that it gives detailed provisions in relation to the principles such as law enforcement judicial powers oversight respect for human rights it also provides guidance on law enforcement activities for ensuring cyber security that underscores the respect for human rights in accordance with international and regional human rights standards such as, such as the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. It also addresses cyber security measures and illustrates the acts. It stipulates the acts that can be criminalized. For example, we went as far as including identity theft, which you do not see in many um, legislation. But ultimately, it identifies recommendations on standards for cybersecurity laws and regulations in the respective African jurisdictions. Just to give a brief outline um, before I give um, the floor back to Magda, it has seven parts. The first part is the introduction, and I'll take you through the components of each part. Part two is the general scope. The general scope just advises African member states on what an appropriate cybersecurity legislation should include as a summary. Part three looks at the general offenses. And of course, African states are not tied to taking everything. There is also the liberty because they are sovereign states to say, we want to look at the general scope and look at what we want to do. We want to look at the cooperation part to give us appropriate understanding. We are not saying we do not have adequate laws, but we also want to understand what cybersecurity management is. So part four looks at criminal procedure and determination of liability. Part five looks at criminal procedure as it relates to law enforcement, different from determination of liability. Part six looks at cybersecurity cooperation, which is very important. And finally, for me, the most important part, cybersecurity management, which is not usually talked about when you talk about cybersecurity. We find that in Africa, there is more of a focus on criminalization, and we don't look at prevention. We also don't look at how we respond at the end of effect. So part one gives you a general guideline in terms of introducing the guideline, what the guideline is about. It talks about the object of the guideline, the purpose of the guideline, and of course, a very important component, which is the definition of 
terms. It defines the terms you will find in the guideline in relation to specific provisions and other aspects of the guideline. Part two looks at the general scope. Like I said, what part two does is to tell states how to focus the content of cybersecurity legislation, what to look at, what is cyber dependent, what is cyber enabled, what the law must respond to, how it will manage and prevent, the sort of services that are essential for functional cybersecurity um, enforcement or cybersecurity policing. It also talks about how to prioritize human rights and a general framework in terms of what would be the content of um, the legislation. Part three looks at general offenses, and this is very important. Like I said, you would see many provisions and such offenses that you do not find in many treaties or even legislation that exists in the continent and outside of the continent. It looks at illegal and unauthorized access, illegal interception, misuse of computer devices and access codes, unauthorized modification of computer program or data, unauthorized interference with computer systems, child pornography, misleading content targeted at children. So beyond just child pornography, how do we deal with content that is targeted to mislead children that may be criminal at the end of the day? Offenses in relation to identity, in terms of personal identity, whether a person is living or is diseased. Denial of service attacks, ransomware and computer extortion, fraudulent inducement, this is something that is also not is new. Online infringement of copyright and related rights. It also looks at cyber squatting, which is also not generally talked about, and unlawful obtaining of personal data. Now, if you go on to part four of um, the guideline, it looks at criminal procedure and determination of liability. How do you determine liability, which is very important? Before you can determine liability in any criminal legislation, it's important that you stipulate how you want to approach that. So it gives guidance on criminal intent. It gives guidance on criminal negligence. It gives guidance on attempt, aid, aiding and abetting and conspiracy, as well as liability of persons and offenses by cooperation. So we are aware that crimes can be committed by corporations as well. And so it gives guidance to how states can ensure liability of persons, whether individuals or corporations, as well as when corporations commit offenses that can be tagged as cyber criminal in national laws or legislation. In part five, he looks at more procedural issues and law enforcement, and then gives guidance on procedural and substantive powers, the scope of procedural measures, conditions and safeguards that are necessary for law enforcement, the preservation and disclosure of data, production and obtaining, as well as search and seizure of stored computer data. It also talks about authorized warrants and the blocking, filtering, and removal of illegal content online, which sort of promotes public-private partnerships. So law enforcement working with tech providers, online um, service providers, internet service providers, as well as the jurisdictional scope of states, when states can enter their jurisdiction in terms of law enforcement or curbing cybercrime. In chapter six, it talks about cybersecurity cooperation and details guidance and advice on cooperation and mutual legal assistance, the measures to enhance law enforcement cooperation, international cooperation, but most importantly, a multi-stakeholder approach to cybersecurity in any African state. So it gives guidance on public-private partnership as is very important. Finally, chapter six, finally, it talks about critical infrastructure. The essence of that chapter is on cybersecurity management. So in terms of cybersecurity management, it tells states how to protect critical national infrastructure, what can be defined as critical infrastructure, how they can go about defining and understanding critical infrastructure. It also advises states on computer emergency response, the need for a 247 cybersecurity point of contact, cybersecurity strategies and framework, the fact that African states need cybersecurity strategies and framework to pursue and promote cybersecurity. The establishment of a central authority for cybersecurity regulation, cybersecurity assistance and support for victims. This has been missing in Africa. We prosecute, we criminalize, we police, but we do not talk about promoting and 
um, establishing support for victims uh, and um, in situations they have fallen prey to cybercrime activities. It also talks about education and training as part of cybersecurity leadership and management, and also advises states on cybersecurity research and development. This is something very important to UNECA. We heard Jean Paul talk about the fact that UNECA is in partnership to develop an African regional center for cybersecurity research. And so this is very important to include in any legislation. And finally, which is ultimate, the need for African states to regularly amend domestic legislation. Cybercrime is different from any other criminal activity, and we see how, you know, revolution, we see how change, amendments, enhancements, you know, growth in terms of ICT penetration and use causes more increase in criminal activity. So it's important that domestic legislation will always be revised or amended to meet expected and contemporary standards at any time. That is just a brief summary of what is contained in the guideline um, for the model cybersecurity law. I give the floor back to Magda and um, look forward to the deliberations that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nena, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, this report has been prepared since uh, maybe 12 months, uh, or 11 months. We have, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, a validation workshop uh, in uh, Nami in Malawi. And what we have to retain, it is, is not a law, it is a guiding principle to assist the member states to develop their national cybersecurity strategy. We cover a lot of area uh, as uh, Nena present on this uh, guiding, uh, on this um, gu guideline. Just I want to give you the floor to, for your view, comment, before we, we proceed to the launch of uh, this report. Yeah, we have uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, let me start by, um, go ahead, please. No, uh, thank you very much. I mean, um, I think this is excellent, an excellent initiative. But just, uh, I was writing quite a few notes, but just for quick clarity. I mean, there are several of the member states uh, who maybe have different cybersecurity laws, different levels, guidelines. They've got uh, data protection acts, which some of these issues address, laws and guidelines. So in a nutshell, I just wanted to really just get a sense of how this guideline marries into this. I think it was inferred but I just wanted it in simple terms with proper clarity so that we can get out of here knowing this is how it merges into this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toko Mia, CEO of Startup Toko. I just wanted to find out about the review process. So South Africa does have a cybersecurity bill. At the moment, we previously had a cybersecurity act. And so we are and have some laws in terms of cybersecurity at the moment. However, um, I think that what we don't have and which we do need is a Startups Act, which is what we're in the process of writing at the moment. And um, we've just collected a movement and are just starting up to get some legs and to get some action in terms of um, creating a, the South Africa Startup Act. Um, so in terms of innovation and new technologies, there's a lot of work going on in Africa at the moment, cross-investment and um, development programs in, in entrepreneurship across sector. Um, I just wanted to find out about the review process in light of it being a recommendation. Um, has there been uh, uh, work done into the review process and how, or what are the recommendations in terms of review and um, progress in innovation technologies? Baratang um, Mia. My question is, John, you mentioned that there's two billion or something that's invested in Africa and there's been a lot of support for women business. I don't know if you mentioned that, but I'm eating it. I just want to find out, was that for training? 
How was it used? Because we find that there's so much money spent on entrepreneurship, and all of it goes to facilitators and trainers, not the business itself. So if you can just elaborate on how that portion was used. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I come from Zambia. My name is uh, Richard Mulonga. I work for Bloggers of Zambia. Um, so we, we have the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act in Zambia. Very problematic law, because even just its genesis, how it was born, first based three months before elections, it was enacted in parliament when all parliamentary standing orders were suspended. Uh, but it's also in the content itself of, of the bill, the, 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 the way the, the, the law is structured. And because it has got very vague and uh, purposely vague provisions um, uh, on search and seizure, for example, publication of false information, um, and, and others, uh, warrants, how, how warrants uh, should be obtained. The, 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 the judicial safeguards are very weak. How do you think, uh, and this law is in court, but also there's some parts have been petitioned uh, by, by lawyers and ourselves, and uh, the, a review process has started. How, how do you think that this review, this, this review can help our situation in Zambia? And I know it is not only in Zambia where uh, these problems, like we, when we come here uh, to the AU, we have these good things that you're talking about. But what is it that happens between Lusaka and Harare, or what happens between Harare and Lusaka? We have this good model, but when it comes to our jurisdiction, we have got these problems that we're discussing, and then these laws are facilitating internet shutdowns and all that. How can you help us to just, uh, you know? Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. No, give. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Victor Kapio from the Kenya ST Action Network, uh, Kicktonet. Um, thank you very much for these guidelines. Um, just some observations. Um, one on the management of cybersecurity. I know Nana said that it was the most important, but also we found it at the end of the presentation. So I'm just wondering, um, in terms of prioritization, we have seen, we have a problem with the focus of cybersec laws, just looking at of being, starting with offenses, you know, and, and it's a big problem. And if we are saying we want to focus on uh, cybersecurity, would it have made more sense to start with cybersecurity management as the primary thing that the law is, or the policies are supporting, as opposed to giving us the criminal aspects? You know, we are, we are not dealing with criminals, we are trying to improve cybersecurity. So, something to think about um, in that respect. Um, the other thing is, um, I've seen a lot of provisions on, um, um, you know, search and seizure uh, and, you know, all these things. How does the guidelines deal with um, judicial oversight? Because we know in a number of countries, that's the biggest gap. Uh, because, like my former colleague, my colleague has just said, um, you know, access, uh, you know, without any formal procedure, without any oversight, without any check and balance, without any reporting framework for transparency. So, to what extent does the guideline help clarify and encourage countries to be more transparent? especially when they want to do interception. And I think lastly um, is on uh, where you mentioned public-private partnerships. Uh, and I know the word multi-stakeholder has been mentioned. And sometimes public-private eliminates uh, civil society organizations. So perhaps would it have been useful to just say multi-stakeholder approaches to cybersecurity as opposed to just public-private so that then uh, part of the stakeholders don't look like they've been eliminated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to Nena to respond to the first round of question, and after I'm going to the, to the second round with uh, Jimson and uh, Nena. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much, Mata, and thanks to everyone for the question. I think the gentleman from Zambia actually sort of answered the first question. The first thing I want to point out, like um, I've said earlier, is um, UNECA is a UN agency and, you know, it cannot force states to make binding obligations um, the way a governmental institution will do. And so this is not a law. It is not a law. It is not going to tell states you must do this. But in terms of its good offices, 
UNECA is giving a guideline, and it is much needed. Like the gentleman from Zambia is saying, many laws in Africa, when you look at the cybersecurity laws, we took an analysis, we did an analysis, you find that some of them are very problematic. And so what this is doing, it's not saying that if you have a law in South Africa, remove it, no. But I feel that the problem is when we gather like this, we talk about Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Morocco, we talk about the big countries doing so much, Tanzania, we forget that there are smaller African countries which still need guidance. <laughs> you still have countries like Equatorial Guinea, Sao Tome and Principe who are not even at this table. So they still need guidance. So we are not saying it affects what South Africa is doing. We are not saying that it's going to displace what any country is doing. This is just on the basis of the good offices of a UN agency to say we need guidelines because there are so many laws um, that need to um, be addressed in terms of international best practices. So it doesn't trivialize and it is clear on the object that it doesn't trivialize state sovereignty. It doesn't tell states what to do or tell states that what you're doing is not good. But it's in terms of clarity, um, you know, this is a guideline and states working with the UN would um, appreciate that. In terms of the review process, um, like Mokhtar said, this has been ongoing for a long time and there was an expert forum. I can still see some of the experts in the room who gave very valuable advice as to how it was reviewed. It was a full room at, um, um, at Malawi where um, experts gave recommendations on what to see particularly taking into recognition the different legal systems that exist in Africa. After that, we also looked at getting experts on the table to review what had been done. And then, like I said, we waited for the third session of the UN ad hoc process to look at more discussions. And that particularly informed the provision on um, cybersecurity cooperation. And like Victor was talking about the OEWG process as well, we looked at that. And that importantly led to the provision on public-private um, partnership. In terms of the billion question, and I, I will leave that for Jean-Paul and Maktar, it's it's not in my within my powers to answer that. Now, um, in terms of the gentleman from Zambia, I absolutely agree with you. Um, that is why this guideline is important. But again, it depends on states. And that is where civil society organizations can then come in with people like Victor um, saying to states that there is a guideline we wish you can look at you can look at the Malabo, for example, African states have not given adequate ratification, so you can't force them. So, but it is where the multi-stakeholder discussion, civil society comes in to say, look, you have this sort of guideline. Let this be a guide as to how you develop your laws. The problem you also have in Africa is many African states think cybersecurity is all about security. And that is why I agree with Victor's position that perhaps cybersecurity management should have come before. So this traditional security-centered approach affects the way African countries design their cybersecurity laws. They just think it's a security sector issue. So what this guideline does also is to temper that understanding. You would see that there are so there is a continuous mention of human rights. Even when you go to search and seizure, you go to warrants, it shows you that you know law enforcement officers must get warrants from the judiciary. And so we assume that the judiciary is independent, is not biased. So we did not see the necessity, like Victor was raising, to start telling judges what to do. I am a lawyer, for example. We believe in, uh, you know, the how will I put it, you know, equity and fairness of the judicial sector, the independence of the judiciary and the fact that judiciary is not biased. So you may not necessarily need to start telling states what to tell the judiciary to do. If the judiciary is biased, it becomes a national issue and the guideline cannot necessarily tell um, the judiciary what exactly they will do. And um, feedback from Victor taking as well. Thank you, Victor, for your points always. Um, I think what you highlighted is important, but I don't think the position. I think why it's even at the end is that when you read it at the end, it remains in your consciousness for longer because it's the last thing you see and it remains in your subconscious more than what you've seen in the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nena. I think we have the same question uh, like, Ma like Namibia, uh, Malawi. Let me give the floor to Jean Paul to answer on the easy question before we go to the second round. Uh, thank you. Um, so firstly, I think the, the question on uh, on investment in tech startups. So the, the figure I gave was 2.15 uh, billion US dollars, which is actually the private sector investment in tech startups. So it's not 
Um, it's not aid and it's not uh, government-led. It's actually showing that a lot is happening in Africa, maybe despite the fact that our, even if our environments are not optimal. Uh, but it means that there are, there are things happening. So in, the, in 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, was the record investment in African tech startups. It shows that there's a lot of innovation happening on the continent. Um, we need to then frame that innovation and provide the opportunities to actually uh, take that even further. And cybersecurity is one of those pillars because that, those funds, we're, we're talking billions of dollars, those funds will dry up in, a, in an instant if the environment for investment is not secure. And here, a lot of that environment is more and more going digitally. So we, that, that's why cyber, the cybersecurity aspect is so important. And then on the question of uh, and the training, so the figure I, I talked about was not about training, it was about actual investment in developing companies, uh, uh, developing startups and, and, and companies. But you make an extremely valid point about where there are funds that are available for capacity building. Uh, we want to make sure that that capacity building is not simply going to consultants, that uh, we want to actually build capacity in the country. So if I use the example of the coding camps that ECA has been uh, organizing, um, actually a lot of the people who uh, are here in IGF, a lot of the trainers that we, that we use now for the coding camps were trained in the first edition of the coding camp. And a lot of them actually here uh, in IGF. So the idea is that we want to build capacity in countries uh, to do so. And I think on cybersecurity, the point will be uh, the same. You have to build local capacity for training and for research, uh, which can then replicate within the country. Uh, then the, the aspects about um, how the model law is applied. We, we can't, we can't uh, insist that governments apply it in one way or another, but We've seen that some of the reticence about um, ratifying the Malabo Convention is that the Malabo Convention is so vast, and some countries have had difficulty, and there are different reasons, uh, some which maybe are more valid than others, but countries have found it hard to just domesticate the Malabo Convention in its entirety. But there are some countries that have taken a very pragmatic approach, and Ghana is an example, where they have taken some the aspects that are more relevant, and they've looked at their existing laws, and they've done that domestication already. So we've realized if there is a model law, then that helps the process for countries to also adapt with their own situation. And then the, linking this with the role of the regional center, which, which is, will be established in Lome, this will help countries as well to do peer learning. So if you take an example of a country that has successfully implemented a cybersecurity law, and it doesn't need to be based on our model law. We heard the example of South Africa, there is already an existing law. Countries may already have an existing law, which is good. The, the model law is not saying that what is existing is not good. It's simply saying that if you want to look at some of the best practices, they are contained in this model law. Uh, and then as countries implement, we want to use the regional center to then demonstrate in very practical terms, because I think it's very important to think about this in practical terms and not just theoretical. Because uh, I think a few of you have made the point that a, f a few governments, as soon as they think of cybersecurity, the first thing they think about is counterterrorism, restriction, means of control. And that's the wrong way to look about it, to look at it. Cybersecurity is a building block for the digital economy and for digital transformation. So if the first reaction is to look at restriction, then that's not the point of, of implementing cybersecurity. You're trying to make a road safe. You're not trying to close the road. You're trying to make sure that the road is, uh, is, is able to get people from A to B as quickly and safely and simply as possible. And that's what a cybersecurity law should be about. And I, I really uh, agree fully with the point from Nena that the role of civil society, I think, will be to also show this is a model law, and if you and, and certainly I think it is valid to say that if if the uh, and there's no one size fits all, but certainly if there are if there is if if in certain countries we see that cybersecurity aspects are being applied too restrictively, then there's a big role for 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 civil society to use the model law as an advocacy tool to try and bring countries. Uh, towards a more practical and uh, user-friendly experience. And I, 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 
I really appreciate the inputs and the proposal for looking at multi-stakeholder um, engagement and not, not just necessarily focusing on the, on the private sector. So I think those are maybe the, I hope I've covered the points. If I've missed something, tell me. Thank you. Go to the second round. No, after I will come to you later. Let me. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alan Kusuma from Indonesia. I think we have several issues that looks uh, quite the same about criminaliz mm -hmm. criminalization uh, issues on yeah, several issues that Nena has mentioned also. Uh, I just want to know about uh, the standpoint of this cybersecurity model law on how to uh, have the digital forensics measure in um, handling the cybersecurity incidents or um, cybersecurity uh, crime. If you can elaborate on Thank you. Jimson, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jimson Lulufui. I was one of the expert uh, group members. I really want to uh, commend UNECA, uh, JP and uh, Makta, and Nena for the excellent vision and the job done. Uh, <coughs> let me j first say that, this is just a comment, let me say that uh, the whole essence of uh, cyber security is basically to guarantee the confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability of uh, internet resources that will enhance development. And then when there are infringements, then there has to be uh, penalties. So that's the whole idea, to secure our infrastructure, internet economy, basically. So as Nina mentioned, uh, the management of cyber infrastructure is actually a big priority. That is, as you said, it's very correct. So how to manage it to ensure vulnerability are identified and are properly mitigated. And if there are uh, issue of infringements, then there should be uh, penalties. Well, uh, I really wish this has come much earlier, but it's still okay, as you said, because uh, Immediately, Nigeria came out with this uh, cyber crime law in 2015. As uh, the chair of the Africa City Alliance, then we took a review and we saw uh, glitches there and we raised it. And that's what they took to court of law. And uh, that was why the uh, ECOWAS uh, Court of Justice uh, said it has to be reviewed. So, if this has been there at that time, yeah, it will have helped. So, this is very, very useful. And I really appreciate uh, UNECA for doing it. And uh, as the parliament in Nigeria will going ahead, seeing this now from UNECA, it may, uh, corroborates what we have said before, that uh, it has to follow some uh, particular frameworks. No conflict. There should be no conflict. So just to say uh, thank you for the job done. Thank you for this comment and for commanding the work done. Uh, awesome. I will not uh, re re uh, say once again what uh, Jimson said, but the fact is uh, it's again uh, great uh, work that you have been doing at ECA with the report yesterday that you launched uh, about the cyber security uh, over the 40 countries, uh, providing, uh, um, um, identifying, giving information, su such important information is very important. Uh, the cyber security model law is extremely important for many countries we have met where people do not have uh, the proper uh, knowledge and experience to, to put together a proper uh, law. <coughs> the only thing I would suggest uh, just for you to take into consideration is to uh, make uh, at least two workshops uh, about the model law, one for the French-speaking countries and one for the English-speaking countries, uh, and for this to invite multi-stakeholders uh, to know, to understand better the whole principle about the model law and to help them really start building their own uh, capacity with that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. One minute, because we are running out of time. Mm. because it was misunderstood yeah so it was not it's not really anything more 
Uh, and maybe I should have also introduced myself. My name is Catherine Adair. I'm the outgoing uh, director of research at the Web Foundation, but I've been working in cybersecurity governance for the last six years. I won't go into further details. So the question I was asking, and uh, maybe it was misunderstood, was just to get the clarity. And the clarity has come. So it's more of a comment that I see this as an opportunity to actually help even reviewing the existing laws and rev existing documents. So that was the clarity I was requiring, because then I can even go back to Kenya, Rwanda, and say, hey, you can use this law for this. So I needed that clarity. That's where I was coming from. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, please uh, answer this question before we conclude. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the comments that have come. And I just wanted to say to you, um, to Maktar and Jean-Paul, that I agree that there should be a workshop um, for African countries. I think that's a very valid point to elaborate on this. In terms of the question on digital forensic, um, if you look at the guideline, it talks about two important sections, the part on law enforcement, criminal procedure and law enforcement, and also the, um, the other part in terms of mutual legal assistance. So you cannot necessarily spell out um, in terms of such a rule, how to go about digital forensic. These are more procedural issues that would happen in the court of law, as well as doing law enforcement. So um, that gives a broad guideline as to what states, for example, there is search and seizure and all of that. Law enforcement officers in terms of jurisdictions will understand what procedures for law enforcement and forensic. But like I said, the model guideline has already elaborated as well on um, mutual legal assistance. And I think for enforcement issues and procedural issues, law enforcement officers can then underscore that on the general framework and whole framework of what is appropriate for cyber um, security and proceedings in relation to cyber criminal activities. Thank you, Th thank you very much. Uh, what we have to return for this uh, session, it is uh, this document. It is not a law. It is a guiding principle. As you know, you have 17 countries having a cyber security framework in the continent. But this framework have a lot of missing link. When, you, when we go to the infrastructure management, child por pornography, also in the regional cooperation. Even the regional cooperation, when you look at the Malabo Convention, we have a missing link on that. And this document will uh, provide opportunity for the country who already have uh, their uh, uh, model laws, their policy framework on cyber security, to update their uh, policy. And it's more important also for countries who do not have now, because they are going to start by zero, and uh, we provide all information necessary for them to draft an adequate uh, framework on cyber security because the guideline is, is based, as Nena say, on the best practice, not in Africa, in the world. And also, we look at at the national level, the country where we make a lot of progress, uh, the country in reference in uh, cyber security, we take on uh, the lesson learned from this country to develop this uh, guideline. The name is very clear, it is a guideline. And now it's more important also for the civil society. Yeah. Because uh, cyber security, it is an issue for everybody. We need to build the capacity for everybody for cyber security. And why this document is important? For the civil society, for the parents, because uh, I think the parents are not uh, many times at home. And you have a kids, you don't know how they go into this uh, online service. And this will help them to, edu to educate the, the kids, also to know how we can navigate it in this digital era, as well as how we can put in place uh, adequate policy regulatory framework on cyber security to protect the citizen. It is important, I think, for all African countries. And also this uh, guideline also, it is a general guideline we can uh, apply in Indonesia. Let's, yesterday we, 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 we present our study. Uh, we have uh, 40 countries in Africa and uh, 30 countries in the Asia. And we, we, have, uh, we are faced on the similar challenge. And I would like to thank you very much all for your involvement because it's too late. And uh, for your contribution also to this uh, guideline model law to thank Nena for the, for the good work. Hmm? Of course, we are going to translate this uh, in the French and uh, publish in the website. And the idea for the uh, workshop also we are going to organize next year uh, based on uh, <laughs> the, our budget. 
and we'll see how to organize this. And thank you very much for. Well, I bet we can do hybrid, yeah, hybrid, yeah, hybrid. And we ask also all people here to popularize this uh, guideline, yeah, in your several network because it's a public document for Africa, even for as a continent. Thank you very much. I would like now to ask everybody to come here to launch officially this uh, guideline model. <laughs> No, we, are, we come here, we come, it's better.